Hello Penguin Lords, I'm the Baby Penguin and welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind. Kicking off the second half of 1962 by unlocking early docking procedures, which gives us access to not only new RCS fuels, but also the first docking contract, which gives us a much needed injection of funds. We're also grabbing a commercial satellite contract, but that massive advance payment allows us to begin constructing our unlimited mass launch pad which is going to be very important for when we want to start building n1 rockets so we want to get building that as soon as possible because it's going to take almost two years to complete in the meantime though we are kicking off our launches with sviet 12 which is simply a second generation navigation satellite and this is actually quite an important launch because it's our first satellite with all of our new scientific instruments we did launch one earlier in the year, but uh, I didn't read the contract, <laughs> and uh, it got handed off to a customer as soon as it reached its intended orbit, so we didn't actually get any science from those scientific instruments. So yeah, this is uh, this one is paying a little bit less than that last contract, but we do actually get to keep the satellite, which is very important. So I'm very sorry that this episode is a few days late. Um, it was supposed to go up on Sunday, but university has been absolutely hectic and after chatting with N9 We've actually decided to just throw the launch schedule out of the window, right? Because now I'm at uni again um, I really just can't keep to every two weeks even if we're just doing six months at a time in game I mean back in the day uh, when we started this series it was in lockdown right, so even though I had uni the only thing I could do with my time when I finished my work was play Kerbal Space Program and work on For All Kerbal Kind, but that's not the case anymore. You know, I'm a very busy person. I do a lot of clubs and societies. I run a lot of clubs and societies. You know, I play piano, play saxophone, play violin, and I sing. Um, so I'm a very, very busy person. Um, and yeah, we just can't keep to a, a release schedule like we used to be able to. So. Episodes are still going to come out roughly every two to three weeks, but they're just going to come out when they're ready um, because trying to reach a deadline, um, it's just not feasible with all my assignments and a dissertation to write and everything else I do on top. And N9 is obviously working as well. So um, as much as I would love to just sit at home and play Kerbal Space Program all the time, um, <laughs> it's just it's just not feasible. Regardless, though, Sviet 12 has reached orbit and we have completed our contract and as soon as we actually complete the contract we're then going to raise our apoapsis we're firing that rda 1300 engine a second time just to increase our eccentricity to make sure that all of our scientific instruments can run properly so once we do that we cut off the engine and we are in a nice eccentric orbit of the earth which should hopefully also provide some more communications uh, trying to get rid of all of our black spots in our communications coverage i think our only remaining sort of black spot is over the South Pole. Um, there is a communication station there, so it's only very specific orbits that uh, that lose communications there. But yeah, perhaps we should launch like a reverse Molnia satellite um, so it spends most of its time over the South Pole. That would solve most of our problems, um, but there aren't really any contracts <laughs> compatible with that kind of orbit. So maybe we'll just have to bite the bullet and, uh, and spend a few thousand funds on that. Regardless though, in the meantime, we are launching Venera 2. And this is our first orbiter. Yes, we're going to send an orbiter to Venus in this transfer window. We actually have two transfer windows this year. We're launching a mission to Venus and we're also launching an orbiter, an identical orbiter in fact, to Mars and hopefully this one we won't lose contact with. Um, so this is actually, yeah, something that uh, I didn't know whether or not it would be possible but uh, with a one ton spacecraft we are just, just able to get into orbit of Venus uh, with our current technology so well that's exactly what we're going to do and with our new scientific instruments we are going to get an absolute plethora of science uh, which is something that I'm rather excited about. The US as far as I'm aware don't have any plans for any Venus or Mars orbiters. They are sending missions to Venus uh, but neither of them are actually orbiting the planet this year so we're looking at a first which is very very nice we did obviously get the first pictures from mars uh, earlier this year as well which was a big feather in our cap so we plot our maneuver and we get ready to ignite the rd109 engine yes it's not an rd119 because i forgot to upgrade it and well i really really regret that because the rd119 has a second ignition and 
we have an ignition failure. Yep, the RD109 fails to ignite, and I forgot to upgrade it to the version which has two ignitions. So that means we have completely stalled an orbit, and Venera 2 just became the most expensive piece of space debris. We can't even communicate with it because its S-band antenna needs to be further from the Earth. And we don't have a UHF antenna to save mass and complexity. So what we're going to do is rename Krasny 2 to Venera 3. And we're also going to not only change that RD-109 engine into an RD-119 engine. So we have an extra ignition in case we have another ignition failure. But we're also swapping out the fuel that the probe uses because at the beginning of the episode we unlocked some new RCS propellants so we're switching the high test peroxide to caviar B and that doubles the delta V we have. We're also spending 330 science unlocking the four prerequisite nodes for 1968 Hydrolox engines, which will give us the KVD-1, our very first Hydrolox engine, which is extremely powerful. But we do have to unlock four nodes with nothing we can use in them before we get access to it, which is a little bit annoying. But while we're rush building Venera 3, we also complete our upgrade to our VAB. So as well as unlocking a third line, we also have plus 25% to all of our build speeds which is extremely useful. But right at the end, in fact, uh, a month after the Venus transfer window, we are launching Venera 3. And as well as, as I said, uh, as changing the RD-109 to RD-119, we have got that massively increased performance from our probe by changing the fuel to Caviar B. So, this is actually, I don't know, almost uh, a silver lining that this probe is significantly more capable than Venera 2 would have been. But thankfully, we get to orbit without a hitch and we extend our brand new scientific instruments. And this time, the engine ignites first try. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, clearly we didn't need the second ignition this time. Although, the 119 does also have significantly higher reliability. But we can't use it on all of our launch vehicles because it does have a lower rated burn time than the 109. So some of our launch vehicles which have burn times upwards of five minutes uh, do still need to use the 109 in their upper stage, which uh, is gonna cause us some problems later on, but uh, <laughs> I won't spoil anything just here. Regardless though, we managed to complete our burn without a hitch and Venera 3, after a few course corrections, is on its way to Venus and it's going to enter orbit in the beginning of 1963. And we should get a lot of science from that. As I said, we've got our new scientific instruments and we've got a lot of instruments on here which take quite a long time, upwards of a month or two to actually complete. So it's a lot more data than you can possibly get from a flyby. Although flybys do certainly have their merits because, uh, you know, Venus is extremely useful as a gravity assist to get to Mercury, which is where Venera 1 is currently headed and will reach at the end of this episode, which is something that uh, I'm very excited about because the Mercury flyby contract is one of the most lucrative inner planets flyby contracts just because Mercury requires so much Delta V to reach unless, of course, you're smart about it and you use a gravity assist because that definitely wasn't just an accidental side effect of the orbit we ended up in after uh, our Venus flyby. No, 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 it was all planned. I promise I'm intelligent. Regardless, in the meantime, uh, we are launching Sviet 13 and this is the communications satellite which will fulfill that commercial contract we grabbed a little bit earlier in the episode. These contracts are actually really, really lucrative. They give you upwards of 100k for completing them, which is really quite a lot for a rather simple and cheap uh, satellite contract. So Placets is going to be launching quite a few of these in the near future. Uh, unfortunately, though, we get another engine failure on an RD-109. This time it's a performance loss as soon as we ignite it. And that just means that we, yeah, we can't get anywhere near orbit and we have to range safety the probe. So not ideal, but it was a cheap mission and it pays very, very well. So we'll be able to build another R-12 and complete that and remain in profit. Still though, in the meantime, we've actually unlocked Lunar Orbiter Capsules, which finally, finally gives us access to Soyuz. You have to grab a bunch of uh, Phobos and Deimos flyby contracts to even afford it. But back to more pressing matters. In mid-October, intercepted telemetry indicates that Discoverer 5, a suspected US reconnaissance satellite, has completed its mission and adjusted its trajectory accordingly. 
A few days later, President John F. Kerman announces a naval quarantine of Cuba, having obtained clear photographic evidence of R-12 ballistic missile facilities being constructed on the island. After several days of tense negotiations, First Secretary Nikita Kerman agrees to return the missiles to the Soviet Union in exchange for a US guarantee not to invade Cuba again. So although the crisis is over, the world has been taken to the brink of war and tensions with the United States remain high. With how valuable satellite reconnaissance has proven itself to be, I think we can expect to see the US Air Force getting considerably more involved in the US's space activities in the coming few years. But while we wait to see what form that takes, we're launching another commercial satellite. And this time we actually reach orbit. We don't have an engine failure and we get our wonderful 100K funds, which is very, very welcome. We're trying to save up as much money as we can. We haven't actually invested any money into build points or research speed in a really long time because the cost of all the infrastructure you need for a lunar mission is so expensive. Obviously, we were already building our unlimited pad, but we still need to get an astronaut complex upgrade and actually buy all of the parts that we need. We're also kind of at the end of the transfer window, if a little beyond it, launching at Krasny 2. Now, originally this was supposed to be launched uh, a month or two ago, but uh, we had to rename that mission to Venera 3 because we don't have another transfer window to either of these planets for almost two years. Um, so I really, really wanted to get an orbiter to both. So thankfully, this upper stage with the RD-119 has enough Delta V uh, that we can still get to Mars slash to Venus, um, even though we're a little bit outside the transfer windows. And thankfully, this mission goes off without a hitch as well. So Krasny 2 and Venera 3 are both on their way. And Krasny 2 actually has quite an ambitious mission, as well as this time, you know, actually staying in contact with us. Uh, we wanted to visit Phobos and Deimos and uh, fly them by. It's got enough Delta V to do that now. I wasn't sure about grabbing those contracts, but uh, after seeing how much of a performance increase we got from changing the fuel, I did accept those two contracts, mainly because the advance payments allowed us to, to buy Soyuz. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm very confident that we can actually do that as well as getting all of the science from around Mars. But that won't arrive for quite some time. And we finished researching lunar-rated heat shields, which means we can begin building Soyuz. We've also unlocked some rover wheels, which means we can begin planning some lunar rovers, which is quite exciting. And we're also going to purchase the lunar-rated descent module, as we receive news that Gemini 3, launched on a Katun 1, has successfully performed a circumlunar flight. Although not entering lunar orbit, this unprecedented display of US capabilities has shown that JFK is serious about his recent pledge to land a Kerbal on the moon before the end of the decade. The moon race gauntlet has officially been thrown down and First Secretary Nikita Kerman demands that the Kaputnik Design Bureau both match this achievement and beat the US to landing on the moon. To this end, Kaputnik is granted the plans for an ICBM designed by a rival design bureau capable of hefting the SAR bomber warhead tested earlier this year. Codenamed the UR500, it will blow the Katun 1's payload capacity out of the water and allow for a stripped down Soyuz named Zond to make a circumlunar flight. But we won't have access to that until. 1963. So in the meantime, we're going to launch another unmanned lunar probe to land on the surface of the moon using the R-13. I am looking to get rid of this launch vehicle as soon as possible. Our larger lunar payloads, including perhaps a larger, more capable lunar lander, maybe a lunar communications network, a lunar rover, perhaps even a sample return lander will be launched on the Proton. And I'm thinking that we can actually upgrade the R-11 with with some of the engines we'll soon have access to. Unfortunately though, yeah, uh, the R13 demonstrates the reasons why I'm looking to get rid of it as its core RD215 engine explodes just over a minute into flight. So yeah, not ideal. That's our third mission critical engine failure this episode. 
So I think quite a few of my department heads are getting sent to Siberia this year, particularly with the US's successful crewed circumlunar flight. And the string of failure doesn't end there because we have yet another ignition failure of the RD-109. The R-12 is one of those launch vehicles I mentioned that needs to use the 109 because of its burn time. I thought to myself, well, I can't really end the episode there. So we're going to slip a little bit into 1963 and swap back to Venera 1, which is on its way to Mercury. So we're performing a small correction burn and then we're going to fly past extremely close to Mercury's surface, within 30 kilometers in fact, and try and get as much data as we can. Now the entire flyby is only gonna last a couple of hours because Mercury's sphere of influence is really pretty small. There's no way we can get into orbit of Mercury. And in fact, with the orbit this is gonna kick us into, there's no way with the amount of Delta V left on Venera 1 that we can ever visit Mercury or Venus again. But this is still an extremely impressive achievement. The first spacecraft to visit Mercury and we did it on a shoestring Delta V budget. With Venera 1's successful flyby of Mercury, we get 60 science and 1.3 million funds, as well as a few upgrade points, which we are going to sink into our production lines because our rate of production is actually beginning to fall behind the United States. And right before the end of the episode, we do actually unlock 1964 stage combustion engines, so we're only one node away from unlocking Proton. 1964 stage combustion engines actually give us the NK9V, which will allow us to upgrade the R11 to match the performance of the R13. Now, we will probably have one more launch of the R13 because one of them is half built, but from then on, I think we're going to upgrade the R11 and use that to launch our future lunar probes because it's considerably more reliable. The R13 has a terrible track record and it just has way too many engines, way too many stages, far too many opportunities for things to go wrong. But that is the end of the episode. In the next episode, which will probably be in two or three weeks' time, you can expect to see the first launch of Soyuz. In fact, we're going to try and replicate the planned mission profile of Soyuz 1 and 2, hopefully minus killing the crew of Soyuz 1 uh, and rendezvous to Soyuz in orbit and dock them together. So that's going to be a first for our space program. We are also, of course, going to attempt to launch a circumlunar flight around the moon to match the United States' achievement. But as I said, that will be in the next episode. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I have been the Beardy Penguin, and I will see you all next time. A massive thank you to my patrons and donators for their generous support and an extra special thank you to Madzor, Peter Lushtenetz, The Amazing Steak, Axel Jensen, Delta V, Dennis Klomp, Vermouth, Lady Lags a Lot, Simone67, Olaf Hammerhand, Scott Milligan, Nicholas Popkus, World, Wafer, Jagnath, Weir, Extra Crispy, Dreister, Lightning Gamer, Elmac and Nobody Special.